Welcome to a crash course in pediatrics. My name is Dr. Shahid. I'm a general pediatrician and medical educator. CRASH stands for Clinical Reasoning and Analytical Skills with Shahid. The goal of this course is to teach clinical reasoning skills to medical students and residents. This is a series of lectures that will take you through several pediatric cases where you will learn how to critically think through a patient case and come up with a broad differential diagnosis. These cases are intended for educational purposes only and are not intended for actual patient care. The objectives of the crash course are listed here. So let's start our case. In this case, we have a 10-month-old male who presents with one-day history of lethargy and vomiting. The patient had been well until one day prior to admission when he began vomiting. Mom states he had been playing with his four-year-old sibling in another room when she heard him vomit. She did not notice any shaking at that time. Since then, he has continued to become more lethargic and has vomited six times. The emesis is non-bilious, non-bloody. Mom says he has felt warm to touch since yesterday. The child's last stool was yesterday before the vomiting started and was normal. He has had upper respiratory symptoms for the past two to three days and he has had two wet diapers since the vomiting started. Past medical history includes no hospitalizations, but he was diagnosed with a right-sided hydrocele at birth. Immunizations are not up to date since parents have refused to get any of the vaccines. He has no known drug allergies. Birth history, he was full term, NSVD with no complications. He drinks Similac with iron, takes about six to seven eight ounce bottles per day, and eats baby food two to three times per day. He crawls and he stands with support and says mama and dada. Socially, he lives with the mother, her new boyfriend, a four-year-old sister, and the maternal grandmother. Family history includes a maternal grandmother with non-insulin dependent diabetes and an uncle with seizure disorder. On physical exam, vital signs include a temperature of 38.2, a heart rate of 118, a respiratory rate of 24, and a blood pressure of 88 over 54. His height and weight are between the 25th and 50th percentile. In general, he appears listless and does appear moderately ill-appearing but no acute distress. Skin exam does show slightly decreased turgor, but no rashes. HENT is essentially normal. His neck appears to be supple. Lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Cardiac, he has a regular rate and rhythm with no murmurs. Abdomen is soft, non-tender, with some minimal distension, no masses, and no hepatosplenomegaly. Back exam, he has no scoliosis, but there is a sacral dimple that is present. On genital exam, he has moderate swelling of the right scrotum that transilluminates with light. Extremities, no clubbing, cyanosis, edema, and full range of motions. On neural exam, he has mild generalized hypotonia, is lethargic, but no focal deficits. Cranial nerves 2 through 12 are grossly intact, and he has 2 plus reflexes in all extremities. So to summarize our problem list, we have a 10-month-old male who is lethargic and hypotonic, has been vomiting, had a recent resp upper respiratory infection, has a history of a hydrocele, family history of non-insulin-dependent diabetes and seizures, has a sacral dimple on exam, and has not received any immunizations. So in this case, we have a 10-month-old male coming in with altered mental status. And basically, he's kind of encephalopathic, given the fact that he is lethargic and hypotonic. So let's go through the differential diagnosis of a 10-month-old presenting with altered mental status. The first category you have to think about, uh, we can talk about, is infection. So when a child comes in with altered mental status and is lethargic or hypotonic and encephalopathic, you have to worry about a CNS infection. So you have to worry about meningitis and encephalitis causing uh, this type of a process. So acutely, he can have some sort of bacterial meningitis, 
um, uh, or he could have some viral meningitis, or he can have some sort of viral encephalitis. Um, so you have to think about meningoencephalitis causing a child to come in with altered mental status. So I think that's very, very high on the differential diagnosis because that can be uh, life-threatening if it's a bacterial infection. So thinking about CNS infections, um, uh, highest on the category of, uh, of the differential, I think is extremely important. Um, and there's different viruses, there's different bacteria that obviously given his age that you can, uh, you can consider. Um, uh, and he actually has not been vaccinated, right? We had the history that uh, uh, parents have refused vaccinations. So that uh, uh, makes it a little bit more worrisome as far as a bacterial uh, meningitis uh, with, uh, for example, pneumococcus, uh, because he has not gotten the conjugated pneumococcal vaccine um, and uh, H. influenza type B and other uh, vaccines. So uh, um, that is something of, uh, of concern. Uh, is, a, is a CNS infection like vectoral meningitis or some other viral type of men meningitis or encephalitis. Uh, the next category that we can think about after infection, uh, let's talk about uh, neural causes. Um, so there's lots of uh, neurologic causes that can uh, present with altered uh, mental status. Um, he could have had some sort of seizure um, and be uh, postictal. Um, uh, and, uh, and now he is uh, kind of out of it and, uh, uh, hypothonic and uh, hypotonic and lethargic. Um, so he could have uh, had a seizure. There is a family history of a, a history of a seizure disorder. Um, although mom did not witness the actual seizure when she went in uh, because the child was in another room playing with uh, the four-year-old sibling, uh, she might have missed the actual seizure and now was kind of more post um, So that's uh, uh, something to consider as far as altered mental status uh, related to neurologic uh, causes uh, uh, that he had uh, some sort of a seizure. Um, other type of things, um, he could have had some sort of uh, CVA or stroke or uh, um, had, had like an AVM that, uh, that ruptured um, and had some sort of uh, intracranial hemorrhage uh, as, a, as a result of that. Um, so, uh, so that's possible uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, so he had some sort of bleed, a hemorrhagic stroke or ischemic stroke uh, for, for some various reasons. Um, so that's on the differential uh, uh, as well. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, uh, actually going back to the seizure, he actually might have, he could have some hypoxia and some uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, so it could be that he had a seizure and uh, um, was hypoxic and now has suffered some sort of neurologic uh, uh, complication related to uh, the hypoxia. Um, so that's a possibility as well. Um, another uh, consideration is uh, some sort of uh, brain tumor. Um, he could he could have a, a posterior fossa tumor, um, uh, causing him to have uh, um, altered mental status, um, and maybe it's actually causing uh, increased intracranial pressure uh, related uh, to the tumor, um, and that could be causing uh, the uh, um, the mental status changes and the uh, uh, hypotonia and lethargy as well. So. Uh, um, the tumor itself, it could have bled or there could be some edema, so lots of issues with that or increased inter intracranial pressure. Or he could have uh, uh, other causes of uh, hydrocephalus um, that can cause him to have increased intracranial pressure and present with altered mental status as well. Um, we do have a history that he has a, uh, uh, a sacral dimple, um, and uh, as long as we're sure it's a dimple and it's not actually kind of a sacral pit or a, a track, um, because if he has an underlying uh, myelomeningocele, um, that could put him at risk for uh, hydrocephalus, and that could cause the increased intracranial pressure and uh, the ultra mental status uh, uh, as well then. Um, so those are some of the neurologic things uh, that, uh, that we can think about. Um, the next category, uh, as we think about uh, um, intracranial hemorrhage, um, we can think about uh, trauma. Um, so some sort of trauma causing the intracranial hemorrhage, right? So some sort of abuse, uh, shaken baby, uh, uh, head trauma, things like that, right? So, uh, so, uh, so you can have uh, um, some sort of uh, head trauma. Um, you can have uh, uh, abuse, shaken baby syndrome, um, you know, things like that. Um, uh, causing to have the intracranial hemorrhage, but related to some sort of uh, trauma. So it could have been accidental uh, trauma as well, right? Uh, they were um, playing together, the sibling, four-year-old sibling and the 10-month-old uh, um, patient were playing together in a separate room. So it's possible that maybe there was some accidental trauma uh, while playing with the sibling or um, 
uh, it's possible there was some sort of uh, intentional trauma. Um, there, the mom has a new boyfriend who is not the father of this child, um, so it's possible that uh, there was some uh, uh, intentional trauma and abuse causing um, uh, the uh, the uh, head injury and uh, therefore uh, um, the alter mental status. Um, so I think that's something to uh, to always uh, consider. Uh, um, uh, as well then. So uh, those are some of the things that uh, you have to think about initially. Um, probably another uh, category that should be high on the list given his age uh, is ingestion. Um, so he's a 10 month old, he's crawling uh, um, and uh, moving around. He has a four year old sibling. Uh, the sibling might have gotten into something and given given it to him. So what uh, ingestion uh, is, a, is a, a, a major consideration in this uh, age group uh, as well. So some sort of toxic ingestion. So, uh, so acutely, um, you can have uh, an acute ingestion or you can have a chronic ingestion. Um, the chronic ingestion you think about is, is lead, lead toxicity can cause you to have encephalopathy and alter mental status changes. That will come on a little more uh, 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 subtly and a little more slowly, but some sort of acute ingestion uh, uh, can cause you to have mental status changes as well. So, um, you know, alcohol, benzodiazepines, uh, barbiturates, different things, you know, depending on what's available or uh, uh, in the medicine cabinet or in the, in the house, um, different ingestion. So the child uh, himself getting into it or a sibling, the four-year-old sibling getting into it and giving him something um, so some sort of toxic ingestion uh, uh, um, causing these type of uh, uh, an ultra mental status uh, type of uh, uh, type of picture um, and then uh, a couple other categories that uh, uh, we can uh, think about um, uh, let's uh, let's see, let's move on to uh, this side um, so the next categories will be more kind of metabolic and electrolyte uh, type of uh, 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 causes um, so uh, some of the metabolic and electrolyte type causes uh, we should start to think about in a 10 month old presenting with ultra mental status as well. So metabolic and electrolytes, so let's talk about metabolic causes first. So uh, metabolic causes of uh, uh, of uh, ultra mental status. Um, so when I'm thinking metabolic, I'm thinking uh, um, uh, some sort of uh, acidosis um, for, for various reasons. So if, they, so if he has a, a severe acidosis, um, and that could be from uh, vomiting, dehydration, hypovolemia, sepsis, shock, things like that. Um, uh, he has been vomiting for the last day or so. Um, so he could be just severely uh, acidotic and have lactic acidosis from dehydration. Or if he's got bacterial meningitis, he could be in shock and sepsis um, and he can have uh, uh, um, acidosis uh, related to that. Um, and then uh, uh, I guess uh, other cause of acidosis other than lactic acidosis would be uh, ketoacidosis, right? So if he has um, some sort of uh, um, uh, DKA, right? He's presenting a DKA um, and he can have ketoacidosis and that can cause you to have the uh, uh, um, uh, presentation of ultra mental status uh, as well. So I think uh, um, that's another metabolic type of a process that uh, that, that you have to think about uh, uh, as well. And other, other metabolic type of things, uh, we can think about uh, other kind of inborn errors of metabolism. Um, so uh, he is uh, less than a year of age, so you still think about uh, some of those inborn errors of metabolism. Um, uh, so uh, he can have uh, uh, different organic acidemias and amino acid uh, uh, defects. Um, he can have uh, a urea cycle defect. Um, uh, uh, that can cause you to have uh, uh, increased ammonia levels and uh, um, uh, ultra mental status. So a lot of the inborn errors of metabolism, you'd, you'd have to uh, uh, really uh, uh, think about uh, as well. So I think that's uh, another uh, consideration under metabolic. So different forms of acidosis and again a lot of the inborn errors of metabolism will also give you acidosis um, as well or it can give you other changes and we can kind of think about this under uh, kind of electrolyte uh, type of things and you can almost kind of lump these together metabolic and electrolyte because there's a lot of overlap right. Um, so I, I mentioned uh, um, uh, the, the DKA um, Right, uh, so he could have ketoacidosis, um, or he could have uh, the opposite of uh, DKA and have hypoglycemia, um, presenting with ultra mental status as well. Right, and the hypoglycemia, the different inborn errors of metabolism, the glycogen storage defects, um, and other uh, uh, inborn errors of metabolism can present with hypoglycemia. Um, so you can have uh, uh, sugar issues. Um, again, you can have ketoacidosis from DKA and present with ultra mental status, or 
you can uh, uh, present with altered mental status secondary to some sort of underlying cause that can uh, uh, predispose you to hypoglycemia related to inborn neuro's metabolism, or it could relate to some sort of uh, ingestion as well. Um, there's a grandmother in the house uh, that they live with that has uh, 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 type 2 diabetes and is on uh, uh, medications for that. So again, it's possible that the child got into grandma's medications um, uh, for, for her diabetes and now is hypoglycemic as a result of that. Um, so that's, uh, I think, a major consideration uh, uh, as well uh, um, as causes of altered mental status and the, uh, and the hypoglycemia. And then other electrolyte uh, type of things, uh, um, so you can have issues with your sodium, you have issues with your potassium, maybe issues with your, uh, uh, your calcium. Um, so all of these electrolyte abnormalities for various reasons can cause you to have uh, altered mental status. So again, it could be just dehydration, it could be an inborn metabolism, it could be, um, you know, DKA, it could be a lot of, uh, a lot of different things that are, that is uh, causing this as well. Um, and uh, when you think about electrolytes, you think about the congenital adrenal hyperplasia causing you to have a lot of electrolyte imbalance, right? So typically you have salt wasting uh, with that, um, and then you have hyperkalemia uh, uh, with it. Um, you can get acidosis, you can get hypoglycemia because you have a cortisol deficiency. So an adrenal crisis or adrenal insufficiency or congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, all those can uh, cause you to have altered mental status and uh, cause electrolyte abnormalities um, that uh, you, you'd have to, uh, to think about. Um, so those are some of the other things you can consider and we can kind of lump those under kind of electrolyte uh, type of uh, type of causes of uh, altered uh, uh, mental uh, status. Um, and then uh, I think uh, a couple other ones that we've kind of been uh, kind of thinking about uh, um, with, uh, we mentioned with inborn areas of metabolism, um, that uh, you can have hyperammonia type of stuff, so liver uh, issues, right? Um, so you can have liver failure or hyperammonia, uh, and that could be from a urea cycle defect. Um, so different causes of, of uh, increased ammonia level. Uh, you can have uh, uh, Rye syndrome um, as well, um, where uh, you take aspirin uh, while you have a varicella infection or influenza infection. Um, that can cause you to have encephalopathy uh, related to that. So that's Rye syndrome, so it's related to liver issues. Um, so, uh, um, so those are some other things that uh, uh, you'd have to uh, uh, think about uh, as well. Um, and then since we're talking about liver, then we should also think about uh, GI causes and GI tract causes of, um, of uh, encephalopathy. Um, and I think this is actually a, a very important consideration here. Now, we did mention uh, um, you know, dehydration and acute gastroenteritis and dehydration. So we can repeat that under kind of uh, GI, although we've mentioned under, under acidosis, but that's something to, uh, to consider. Uh, but then there's other causes of uh, acute gastroenteritis um, and uh, uh, um, you know, viral causes and bacterial causes. Uh, one of the bacterial causes you think about is Shigella. Uh, Shigella can produce a Shiga toxin, where there's different E. coli strains that can produce a Shiga-like toxin, um, and that can actually cause encephalopathy and cause seizures. Um, so uh, uh, a Shigella a gastroenteritis can, uh, can uh, cause you to have uh, mental status changes uh, as well. So I think that's a uh, uh, consideration as well. And then when you think about uh, Shigella or E. coli, then you think about the complication of HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, and that can also give you encephalopathy as well. So you get a hemolytic process, um, you have uremia um, and renal uh, dysfunction, and then thrombocytopenia is the third component of HUS, secondary to uh, many times a bacterial gastroenteritis, um, and the uremia um, can cause you to have uh, mental status changes, and HUS itself can cause you to have encephalopathy and mental status changes as well. Um, so that's a, a, another consideration uh, as well. And then when you think about GI, other GI causes, um, things that maybe are not as intuitive, but a GI obstruction, a GI tract obstruction, can actually cause you to have encephalopathy. So the thought is that there's some uh, uh, um, opioid uh, uh, release endogenously uh, when you have a GI tract obstruction. And that can cause you to have encephalopathy and present uh, uh, with uh, altered mental status and uh, 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 present kind of lethargic and things. So anything that causes a GI uh, tract obstruction. So things to consider uh, could be uh, kind of a small bowel obstruction. So if you had like a malrotation or a volvulus um, uh, that now obstructed, um, uh, you can think about uh, in a, uh, incarcerated hernia uh, as well. Um, so incarcerated hernias, inguinal hernias. 
um, that are incarcerated can present with uh, mental status changes as well. Now he does have a history of a hydrocele, and a lot of times with hydrocele, you can also have a concomitant uh, inguinal hernia as well. So it's possible he has a hernia that is now incarcerated, and now he's presenting with an obstruction and mental status changes. Um, then another consideration would be uh, intussusception. Um, intussusception. Um, it's always hard to spell that word. Um, intussusception uh, can also present with an obstruction and can present with uh, uh, altered mental status and uh, um, lethargy and hypotonia and things as well. Uh, so any of these uh, uh, GI processes, GI tract obstructions can actually present uh, more encephalopathic with uh, altered mental status changes. And I think that's a, a very important teaching point. Uh, the connection between neuro and GI. Right? So we just talked about how GI obstruction uh, can cause release of endogenous opioids um, that can then cause you to be encephalopathic and uh, decreased uh, mental status. Um, so you, you so you think about somebody presenting neurologically but actually has something going on in their GI tract. And the reverse is true as well, where somebody presents with, for example, a brain tumor and increased intracranial pressure and presents with a lot of vomiting, um, uh, and they actually have something neurologic going on. So they present with GI symptoms with the vomiting, um, and they turn out to have something neurologic, or they can present with neural symptoms and uh, turn out to have something GI tract related. So keeping that uh, in mind, uh, the neural uh, uh, causes and GI causes and how they can overlap, and you can see uh, uh, um, different uh, manifestations uh, of each one of those. Um, and then uh, um, maybe uh, uh, just one other thought, uh, uh, respiratory wise, respiratory tract, if you have increased CO2 levels, um, then you can be uh, lethargic and altered mental status as a result of that. So if you have bad asthma and you're retaining CO2, um, that can cause you to have mental status changes as well. Um, so I think uh, that uh, kind of uh, summarizes the differential diagnosis for uh, altered mental status. Um, so I think a big consideration and urgent consideration is infection. Uh, bacterial meningitis, encephalitis um, type of uh, type of process, um, neurologic causes, um, and then trauma, uh, ingestion, uh, metabolic, electrolyte, and GI, um, liver maybe a little bit less likely, but there's so many things you have to consider uh, on, a, on a child coming in with altered mental status. Um, it's a broad differential diagnosis, um, so you have to use your clinical reasoning skills and your analytical skills uh, to create the differential diagnosis, um, and then uh, the workup is based on uh, what you think might be going on based on the history and the exam to uh, help you decide where you want to go. So let's see how this case unfolds and what type of workup was done and what this uh, child ultimately ended up having. So the workup in this child um, started to look into some of the more urgent type of uh, things on the differential diagnosis. So uh, he got a, a, a head CT to make sure there's no trauma or bleed or anything like that, or a hematoma, a subcrural hematoma, nothing like that. Um, and the CT scan came back negative. He had some basic uh, labs done. He had a CBC, a complete metabolic panel and uh, blood culture. He had a UA and a urine culture. Um, and in essence, uh, his UA was normal. His uh, electrolytes were normal. His CBC was totally normal as well. Uh, he had a urine drug screen uh, that was uh, negative. Um, uh, and uh, um, again, going back to his electrolytes, um, his uh, um, uh, glucose was normal as well. It was not high, it was not low. So uh, that approach, again, we ruled out some uh, uh, important things just by doing a basic uh, workup uh, on, this, on this patient. Uh, the patient also had a spinal tap uh, just because of uh, his presentation and the lack of immunizations. And his spinal tap was, uh, was normal, did not have uh, excessive white cells or, or uh, anything on the gram stain to suggest anything uh, um, infectious, or at least from a bacterial perspective. Um, so at that point, the patient was admitted for IV fluids and uh, IV antibiotics was started on IV ceftriaxone um, uh, to follow the cultures and to uh, uh, pursue a further workup. But the initial workup that we did really helped rule out uh, some things based on uh, trauma and uh, uh, um, uh, other things going on in the CNS. Uh, no obvious tumor or uh, hydrocephalus, uh, rule out infectious causes, uh, rule out maybe some of the ingestions based on a negative drug screen. His electrolytes were normal. Uh, it wasn't really that acidotic. Um, so we had started to rule out uh, some of these things. Um, uh, uh, so basically then uh, we were observing him at that point uh, on the IV fluids and the uh, IV antibiotics. Um, uh, and then a few hours later, uh, after he was admitted, he had a bloody stool um, in his diaper.
um, so based on that bloody stool, um, something GI uh, related uh, became higher on the list, so some sort of infectious cause, um, but also some sort of uh, obstruction and intussusception uh, was something that we were now uh, highly considering on this patient who now had uh, bloody uh, uh, stools um, given his uh, vomiting that he was having and his uh, altermental status that he presented with, his recent uh, viral URI symptoms over the last couple of days, um, putting him at risk potentially for uh, intussusception. Um, and, and uh, Pyre's patch hyperplasia um, uh, from that uh, uh, viral process. So we looked into the possibility of an intussusception. Um, he had an ultrasound of his abdomen, uh, which did show uh, he had uh, an intussusception uh, in the right upper quadrant. Uh, so we were sent uh, for uh, a barium enema, um, uh, and the barium enema was able to reduce the intussusception then. Um, so that was the final diagnosis, was that he actually had an intussusception causing him to present with the ultra mental status um, uh, and uh, the vomiting that he was having uh, uh, as well. And um, so that was our, uh, our diagnosis at that point. Um, and he was reduced, uh, it was reduced, um, and then he was watched for 24 hours um, in the hospital after reduction, um, which you want to do is you want to watch a child in the hospital after for about 24 hours after reduction uh, uh, by an enema, because about 10% of patients will have a reoccurrence of the interception. Um, and uh, if it does reoccur, it will reoccur within the first 24 hours after reduction. Um, so that's why he was watched for 24 hours and uh, he was doing well. He tolerated a, a diet after that and then he was uh, sent home uh, uh, at that point then. So just a couple of uh, teaching points about uh, intussusception. So basically it's telescoping of the intestines. Typically it starts at the ileocecal uh, area um, uh, and then uh, uh, telescopes up and kind of usually gets stuck up at the hepatic flexure in the right upper quadrant. Um, and uh, um, the classic uh, symptoms are gonna be uh, this colicky abdominal pain where the child kind of curls up, um, uh, draws up their legs and has this colicky pain. Um, but when a wave of peristalsis comes through and hits that area, it causes them to have the pain and curl up. Um, um, and then as the peristaltic wave uh, dissipates, um, the pain gets better and they uh, uh, improve as well. So this intermittent colicky abdominal pain with kind of drawing up their legs um, uh, and then uh, they can have the vomiting um, and then they can have the current jelly stools. So current jelly, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of dark uh, reddish uh, type, of, uh, type of stool. So that's the typical classic presentation of intussusception, which our child uh, initially did not have, uh, didn't, he never really had the uh, drawing up of the legs and the cramped abdominal pain, but he had more of the ultramental status and ultimately uh, bloody stools or current jelly uh, uh, type of stools. He's in the right age range for intussusception. Typically occurs uh, between 6 and 36 months of age, so he was at 10 months of age. Um, and he had uh, um, uh, the risk factor of uh, um, of recent viral infection, which can serve as a lead point because you get Peyer's patch hyperplasia from a recent viral infection, a respiratory infection, or GI infection, and that commonly serves as a lead point. Um, other things that can serve as lead points for intussusception include a mycocyte reticulum. So when they reoccur, um, uh, the intussusception reoccurs, that's something you have to look for. You have different types of polyps. Uh, you can have uh, uh, GI lymphomas. Um, uh, another entity, uh, HSP, Hanox, Shalman, Purpura, uh, in older, ch uh, older kids can also serve as a lead point for intussusception. Um, so when it's just a, um, a simple intussusception that's easy to reduce and does not reoccur, you don't go looking for other things, but if it's reoccurring um, two times or three times, then you should look for our other lead points as well. Um, and then typically if it does reoccur um, after, the, after the reduction of the enema, then typically we'll do a second enema. And if it reoccurs again, then you might do a third enema, but at that point, uh, you should really be talking to your uh, pediatric surgeon because they might need surgical reduction of the intussusception and looking for a, a possible lead point uh, uh, at that time then. Um, so that's kind of the, the workup that, uh, uh, that that you would do. And ideally, you want to diagnose the intussusception before you get the bloody stools, um, because once you have bloody stools, that implies that there's an obstruction and that there is ischemia and necrosis and sloughing of the GI mucosal tract. Um, and that's why you're having the kind of the bloody stools. So ideally, you want to make the diagnosis of intussusception before the bloody stools occur. Um, uh, and once you have the bloody stools, then you know there's some ischemia that's, uh, that's going on. So ideally, you want to uh, do 
do that, but many times it's very difficult to uh, to be able to uh, uh, to diagnose the, the interception. But you should have uh, a highness of suspicion on a child coming in with mental status changes and vomiting, uh, um, and consider uh, um, interception at uh, at that uh, point uh, on that uh, type of a child uh, as well. Then, um, uh, and like I mentioned before, the interception um, when you have obstruction of GI tract, you can have release of endogenous endorphins that can uh, cause you to have uh, lethargy and encephalopathy or uh, altered uh, mental uh, status then. Um, so those are some of the things that you should keep in mind about interception and uh, this is the kind of the approach that you should take for a child uh, um, who is presented with altered mental status and think of a broad differential diagnosis um, and somebody that's presented with neuro symptoms like mental status changes and seizures and things like that, think about a GI cause and then somebody that's presenting with GI symptoms like vomiting, think about neural causes like increased intracranial pressure or tumors as well, so keep that in mind. So this is a nice broad differential diagnosis for this type of a child, um, and as part of our crash cases, focus on the clinical reasoning and the analytical skills, and not necessarily specifically about each one of these uh, diagnoses, so you can read more about each one of these on your own, um, but again, the approach is to think broadly about the differential diagnosis and how you might approach the child and work up the child as uh, uh, part of your clinical reasoning and analytical skills. Uh, so hopefully this crash case was, uh, was beneficial and educational, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our future crash cases as well.